Encounter is brought to you by the Broome County Council of Churches, where we connect compassion with needs as we inspire growth with dignity. You'll find us in special places throughout the community. For those who remain hungry, we provide meals. For those who are challenged, we build wheelchair ramps. We comfort those who are ill, minister to those who are confined, and we remain an advocate for change and understanding on behalf of every element of our community. Connect and inspire. Encounter the Broome County Council of Churches. Good morning. I'm Jeff Kellum. Welcome to this week's edition of Encounter. Uh, My special guest today is the author of a book called Unbroken and Unbowed, uh, A History of Black Protest in America. Uh, Jimmy Hawkins and I go back a long time, uh, but I'm still older than he is. Um, uh, On the split screen, I'm I'm not used to these. And Jimmy, I've shared with you that I I don't usually do this kind of show, but Rather than taking two cameras and two mics to Washington to talk to you, and rather than you're flying into the Broome County Airport to talk to me, uh, this seemed a, a good way to, to get the conversation done about about your book. Um, for, first, welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm so happy and excited to be here with you this morning. Excellent. So you were just in in Buffalo uh, of this recently. Uh, you went up to the Tops Market, and I saw pictures of you in the parking lot there. Just share some impressions of, of what that was like at that horrific scene. Yeah, it, it is really quite a moving um, experience to be there. Um, you know, you, you walk, you know exactly what's going on. The first thing you see are the flowers. I mean, there are memorials just set up the whole side of the um, um, parking lot um, to walk in and the supermarket has been redone as a memorial inside of the supermarket. It, it was really a feeling of ambivalence. Um, because, yeah. you know, I'm glad for the community that they rebuilt the supermarket because some of the comments I hear is that it's desperately needed, but also a sense of you're on hollow ground. Um, I felt, you know, I, the question went to my mind as I walked through the supermarket, did something happen right here in this very spot? And you, you feel really, um, I struggled with feeling I was walking over where someone had got lost their life. And so I think it's, you know, and I've heard the comments from residents that both positions, some wanted the supermarket rebuilt and stay there. Others wanted it demolished. So it was really a very solemn experience. There is a memorial there too. Uh, Is that in the parking lot or in the store? It's in the store. When you walk in at the entrance to the immediate left, they have, it's quite beautiful. It has water raining down and then words on in, on the inside it's a brown huge brown plaque on this there right well i'm glad you were there and i'm glad you got to talk with some residents too that's a both uh, fits in with your your position as director of the office of public policy public witness public witness Yes. Uh, of the Presbyterian Church USA, uh, based you're based in Washington D.C. Um, the office before COVID was in the Methodist Building, which is very ecumenical, um, and it's right there, uh, just really across the street from the Supreme Court Building. I think. Yes. Yes, we were right across the street from the Capitol and the Supreme Court, and I'm serving as the director for both of our advocacy offices. We merged them recently. Well, we have a UN office as well in New York, and I serve as the director there and for the Washington, D.C. Office of Public Witness. So well, tell me, uh, before we get into the book, um, the book is called Unbroken and Unbowed. It's published by Westminster John Knox Press. Uh, but tell me a little bit about your work uh, as an advocate, as an interpreter of what's going on in Washington to the church, mm-hmm. and an interpreter to the Washington about what's going on, uh, what the church's views are. Yeah, it's the Presbyterian Church has been engaged in um, spiritual advocacy and a political forum for the last 70 years. And we have a Washington office. We engage with members of Congress, with the State Department, and also with the White House, especially during this administration. There's been a lot of engagement. Um, Dealing with issues of the public policy positions of the Presbyterian Church, um, dealing with health care, you know, living wage, trying to make sure that the laws that are produced are um, beneficial to American citizens and to global citizens. And also the UN office directly interfaces with the United Nations. Um, so they are part of committee meetings. Um, they have um, the opportunity to um, engage in the building and really to um, be a voice for the church to ensure a just society. Mm. 
That um, it comes out of your experience. Uh, we knew each other at the Presbyterian's Graduate School for Christian Ed in Richmond, which is now part of the Union Presbyterian Seminary. Uh, your journey led you from that school with your master's there uh, to seminary. Mm -hmm. And then where'd you go from there? Yeah, I pastored in two different states for over 25 years. I was in Virginia for five years and in North Carolina at the same church for 20 years in Durham, North Carolina at Covenant Presbyterian Church. I think they would appreciate that shout out. <laughs> right. right. And I can hear that, uh, that Southern uh, twinge in your voice. <laughs> you know, I, I, I find myself every once in a while, uh, even though I was born in upstate New York and, and just nearby Endicott, but um, every once in a while, the pronoun I is pronounced ah, you know. Ah. Uh, <laughs> ah, <man. laughs> yeah. Now, the book, um, I, I assume that the book came out of more than just Colin Kaepernick and uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. You've had this on your mind for some time, I'm sure. Tell me when, when it first occurred to you that this had to be chronicled, this idea of black protests in America. Yeah, you're right. I've always wanted to write a book, and it's, it's been a godsend in my life. Uh, I, I consider God to be my muse because, you know, for most, I'm 63 now, and for most of my life, I had that desire. Wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> 63? Yes, I, I, I'm 63, God bless. <laughs> yeah. How is it me? <laughs> I'm sorry, Jim. Yeah, because I've always wanted to do that and really just never felt the inner motivation to be honest and, and and to be honest jeff not the confidence well you know i want to but i don't know if i can but um i was a black history major in undergrad at north carolina central in durham and you know i've started collecting black history books so that's what you see behind me all of these most of them 90 percent of them are um books on black history and obviously um, theological education works but then when the um colin kaepernick thing started happening and then, you know, I felt that there was a lot of misunderstanding, not only of what he was doing, but also a black protest. And, and it's often deemed unpatriotic. It's often deemed unnecessary that change is happening in the country. And I think all of that kind of um, climax during that period where and I said, well, I'm going to write an article. And that was my first <laughs> response. And then I said, the article turned into a chapter. And it just kind of took on a life of its own. And so I think all of that desire over the decades just kind of poured out um, back in 2017 when I first started writing. Yep. And the the uh, the idea of putting this book together with your own background, with uh, the, the reading that you've done, your, your college major, mm -hmm. and then what was it like to be in Richmond, Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy, to go to school for for you were there for two years or were you there in seminary too no, it's for two years the two years that you wouldn't let me leave richmond virginia yeah yes <laughs> yeah it's it's quite interesting you know richmond is a very interesting place it's the capital of the state um it has um it has diversity as far as its racial demographics um but i remember being there and, and there was some racial tension i felt um, this is what I read in the newspaper, because obviously I spent most of my time on campus. Um, it's the capital of Confederacy, and, and, and part of that is still there. You know, they recently removed, um, I think it was Lee's statue from, uh, what's that, Memorial Drive that they took the statue off of? Monument Avenue. Monument Avenue. Monument Avenue, yeah. The monument. You know it's very well that when you drive down Monument Avenue, it's a monument to the Confederacy. And it had this huge statue in the middle of the street. And so that would always strike me. And I always noticed that, that um, the spirit um, of support for the Confederacy was always still alive in that city. So, but Richmond also, I think, it started making some very progressive moves. I think it has a black mayor now, and, and he's not the first one. Um, it also has an African-American museum um, that it recently constructed. So I think Richmond is really geographically right in the middle of the eastern coast of the United States. Right. I think as far as the country is concerned, it's right in the middle. You you will probably see every extreme um, in Richmond as far as political ideology, mm -hmm. political thought um, in that city. 
Yeah. Well, because we both have, you know, I lived in Richmond for 27 years and mm-hmm. saw such change take place mm-hmm. uh, from the, the white establishment, uh, the white mayor, the white city manager, the white fire chief, the white p- police chief, mm-hmm. uh, and, and then saw the African-American community begin uh, to be um, more active in and in, in, uh leadership roles and, and eventually of course uh governor wilder is the first uh, african-american governor uh, elected in in the state of virginia those years ago um well let's get back to the to the book from um the the uniqueness of this book you had said that that no one else has taken this this topic of black protest mm-hmm. not since colin kaepernick not since the um the olympics with the raised fist mm-hmm. Black Power Movement, uh, you're going back to Africa. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about the five stages of the of the of your book. Okay, and and you're absolutely right, Jeff. There are two, I think, unique parts of the book. One is that um, the scope of it, going all the way back to the 1400s up until 2020, um, and talking about black protests throughout that time frame. No one else has done that. In a couple of the books that I did make reference to. Um, Vincent Harding's book, There is a River. Um, the furthest that either of those books go to is the civil rights movement. Right. Um, and most of them stop at the Civil War and Reconstruction. Um, not a lot of articles, not a lot of research has been done in that. And the other piece is that I divided it into five identity profiles that started in the 1400s that the African-American sense of identity was African. You know, these were individuals who were brought here from Africa, and their desire was to go back to Africa. They didn't want assimilation into the country. And the African, the identity, to a large degree, determined the protest. You know, they were protesting, trying to gain liberation to return home. And so that's um, in the first identity. And then that morphed, and each identity was not placed upon African Americans. It was adopted by African Americans. And that morphed into a colored identity. You know, today to call someone colored is not <laughs> too affirming and it's, and it's offensive. But back then, it was a sign of pride. You know, we are colored Americans. Yeah. Um, and, and even then, they would say we are people of color because they want, they had no identity. You know, their, they, their identity from Africa had been stripped away by that generation. Uh, all of the customs and traditions had been taken away to a large degree. Obviously, some still remain, but none formal formally. And so they said, we want to um, be colored Americans. And, and their f- protest was for rights. You know, they said, we're no law. We, most of, many of them were not born in Africa, so they had no real linkage to Africa as far as memory. And so they said, we want to stay here. And then that morphed into Negro identity, you know, during the civil rights movement. King obviously refers to himself as a Negro, even from Frederick Douglass up to King. Um, Col- Douglas went back and forth between colored and Negro, but a Negro identity from the Spanish word black. But they said, well, we're no longer colored. There, there are some issues with that. We want to be um, called um, American Negroes and with a capital N, which is really fascinating. So during the civil rights movement, that was the push. And then obviously we know that in the 60s, that morphed into um, the identity of being black with Stokely Carmichael, black power. Um, black spirit. Yeah, Black is Beautiful, James Brown, um, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. And during that period, it, it was, I think, it also represented a, a, in a self-awareness that we are Black people and also a pan-African identification wherein, especially with W.E.B. Du Bois, not only about the um, African-American experience, but the experience around the world of, of, of Black people in the Caribbean, in Africa, along that line. And then... Uh, then after that, um, in 1988, Jesse Jackson spoke in New York. He says, well, we no longer want to be called black um, or Negro. We want to be African-Americans. And he really pushed off that, that whole conversation. And the New York Times, I think, was the first major publication that responded and said, well, if, you, if that's the, t- the title you want, uh, we affirm that. And from that point on, utilize African-American. And Jesse was saying it's not only skin color, but it's culture as well. And so we want like Italian Americans, um, we want to have a sense of um, linkage to the homeland, to the motherland, but also the fact that we are Americans as well. So I kind of laid it out in that way. And for me, it, it was very interesting because 
Ron Bennett Jr. especially and others had written articles on um, black identity um, and how it, and so I kind of followed their format, but they really, again, um, looked at it, most of them looked at it two or three identities, but I, I, I felt that um, there were five. And, and the original title of the book was A History of African Colored um, Negro, Black, and African American Identity, a protest. <laughs> Congratulations on editing that down. <laughs> well, I thank my publisher for that. He says, well, that might be a little much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, I love the title because it's, well, uh, let's talk about where the title came from. Uh, first, let me remind our, our, our viewers and listeners that we're talking with Reverend Jimmy Hawkins, who is the director of the Office of Public Witness of the Presbyterian Church USA, the author of a new book called Unbroken and Unbowed, A History of Black Protest in America. Unbroken and Unbowed, uh, where did that come from? Yeah, you know, um, that has been a catchphrase um, within the black community. I think especially with politicians, um, Shirley Chisholm talked about that she was unbrought, unbought. Um, and so I, I, I played with it back and forth, but I came up with Unbroken and Unbowed really to talk about black resiliency, um, the black spirit. Um, and I think in the beginning, I talked about how the response of black people to oppression in this country has not been hatred or anger, but black people, um, African-Americans are very loyal to the country. And, and that sense of loyalty has remained in a sense of patriotic, being patriotic. I mean, I, I'm really amazed. And so their spirit, they still want to be full American citizens. They want to be a part of society. Um, they want to be able to avail themselves of all the opportunities, but also to support their country, to love their country, to be um, active participants in the full life of the country. And so it's almost a spiritual connotation where in our spirit has not been broken that God, and especially the religious aspect where God has been with us and we really feel the presence of God and that God is a liberator, a deliverer, that God is God of justice and a God of love. And so I think that that connection um, with spirituality really inspired me to come up with that title. Right. The, the, the scope of the book uh, from, as you say, the, like the 1400s on, uh, it's just incredible. And, and the research that you've done, I don't know how you found the time to, to carve out, to, to, there it is. <laughs> I didn't have to go far. <laughs> All the books, that's right. You can write this in your study. But, um, the scope of it, and, and I learned so much from the very beginning, um, the, the, the story of the beginnings of, of, of slavery in, in America. And, and you had talked about the fact that um, people weren't seen as, how am I going to put this, um, the color of your skin uh, wasn't so much a matter of of importance as where you were in the socioeconomic. Mm -hmm. the blacks and whites who were in poverty were a, a brotherhood, a sisterhood. Mm -hmm. And then there was a transition where a, a, a very sad time when suddenly color became the, the division. And depending on the color of your skin, that's when we see racial segregation mm -hmm. rear its ugly head. And and it continues to rear its ugly head. We were talking about Richmond earlier in the program. Mm -hmm. Charlottesville, just uh, um, an hour away, is where that white power demonstration took place. Um, and uh, so there's this new rise, it seems, of white supremacy. And, and Jimmy, I have to ask you, are, are you going to replace me? Are, uh, is this, no, I'm not going to replace you. You're, you're fine. You're an expert at what you do. And so, you know, that, that, but that, that, that whole thing about a replacement theory. I mean, yeah, I don't yeah. understand. And, and it's really sad um, because we as Americans, um, we unlearn our lessons. You know, Jeff, as you really stated quite well, um, we are revisiting. Um, some of these old wounds that have always been a part of American society. Um, we have struggled. And, and the thing that's fascinating to me when you study American history is that we kind of recycle the same conversations about race, about yeah. white supremacy. And you, when you look at one thing that's fascinating, between the two um, domestic wars that we had with ourselves, between the, the uh, War of Independence, I call it the War of Liberation, and then the Civil War, um, I call it the War to End Slavery, 
we had a real strong conversation in this country about who are we. Um, after the American Revolution in particular, um, you see all of these northern states start to abolish slavery. And that was a direct result of the American Revolution. Said, well, if we as a nation are to be free and independent, should not all of our the, the residents and citizens here be independent? And so we lost, and as a matter of fact, it was called that time period by some historians, the unfinished revolution, because we were dealing with the issue of race and, and white supremacy, and we really missed an opportunity that ended in the Civil War. Yeah. You know, if we had resolved that issue, we never would have had a Civil War. And so I find that as we deal with these issues of white replacement theory, they really are some of the unresolved um, struggles that we as Americans have had. And because I think even with look critical race theory, um, and, and I try to be sympathetic because I'm a parent, but parents are saying, well, we don't want our children exposed to things that might cause them to feel embarrassed or shame. Children are resilient. The problem is not with the children here. It's the parents don't want to engage in these conversations. And so I think as Americans, and one of the things I'm doing research on now is we don't necessarily have a strong um, sense of curiosity about other people and even about ourselves. We kind of get caught up in our isolated silos. And so... Yes, you're absolutely right. This whole issue, these issues with white supremacy, rep white replacement theory, they really have always been here. You know, they never have really um, been dealt with to a degree where they have um, disappeared from the scene. And so I, I think also, obviously, economics plays a role. People feel economically threatened. You have communities um, that are impoverished. I'm talking about white communities that are impoverished. And so they feel like no one's ever done anything for me. You know, I, I don't consider myself to be privileged. And so there's a backlash, but I think the problem is that oftentimes that backlash has a racial face on it. And we backlash, we, we take it out on individuals who are not responsible um, for um, the systemic issues that we're dealing with in our lives. And we also see um, where we're angry. And I think the anger gets projected, um, again, in a racial manner, wherein these, 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 his, these individuals who are coming from other countries, from Mexico and from Latin and South America, are taking our jobs away. Um, and I think we really need to reevaluate what's the cause of the, some of our own emotional pain. Well, certainly uh, the, the immigrants coming from south of the border are people of color. Mm -hmm. uh, and we seem very open, uh, and, and I'm not being critical of our openness to immigrants from the Ukraine, for example. But I think, um, I think there's still that ingrained prejudice. Uh, and I, I saw on a news program just recently a park that had reopened, and I can't remember the city, uh, that had been uh, a part of a, a segregated uh, a park for the blacks on one side, park for the whites on the other. And now this park has come together and watching these children play, mm -hmm. black and white kids who just see each other as kids. That's right. That's right. Uh, they don't care. They yeah. Don't care. They just want, to get, just want to have fun. And I, I, I will say this, you know, being in D.C., a lot of our political leaders are not helping at all. And, and some of the rhetoric that's put forth, um, the hatefulness um, and the, 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 the divisiveness. And, and I think it's all for political gain. And I think it's a sad reflection on our political leaders who go to D.C. as what we used to refer to them as public servants. Um, yeah. I think that's been completely dropped now. And so we've got such partisanship um, and divisiveness politically. And I really place a lot of it at the feet of our political leaders. I think they have got to do better. Yeah. You know, and, and reading your book, um, uh, there's so much history, uh, uh, commentary, um, you're dealing with the past two presidents, um, uh, up to, to Biden, Obama and Trump. And, and then, um, but I have to say that you really hooked me when you got into the pop culture mm -hmm. that, that I never, uh, you know, black protest includes all these songs from the sixties and seventies. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I mentioned, you always going to name drop, but I, I'm going to do it anyway. That my first rock interview was with Curtis Mayfield. Oh, wow. Athens. They were at, uh, what was called the Moscow auditorium in Richmond. And, um, uh, he said, our music comes from the church. Wow. So wow. he's, we, we learned our music from the church. And so our music is spiritual music. Mm -hmm. So whether it's people got to be free or whatever. So we have a couple of minutes left. Talk about the role of the church, not necessarily our denomination, but what's mm -hmm. the role of the church in facing 
uh, the issues of, of racism in our society? Oh, I, I definitely, it's not only by being a minister, but by growing up in the church. Um, I think there are two, I, I would say two dimensions to the role of the church. Uh, one, for the black church, um, protest has always gone hand in hand. Um, from the moment that the first enslaved men and women embraced Christianity, um, they, they began to learn more about it, and, they, and especially when they came into knowledge of the book of Exodus, <laughs> and you have these slaves who are liberated by God. You get yeah. to the prophets. All they talk about is justice. Um, you get to Jesus, and Jesus talks about the fact that, you know, we're to love God, to love our neighbor, to love one another. Um, he says in Matthew 23, 23, do just do, um, um, he criticizes the religious leader, says, you have neglected justice. How could you do that? And so for the black church, it's interesting because political activism and, and, and divine worship have always gone hand in hand. You know, mm -hmm. you look at the slave revolts, most of them were led by black preachers. Um, and it's really amazing how Thurman told this story um, when he was still living, um, this African-American um, chaplain. And he in Morehouse, and he talked about how his grandmother would tell the story of the black slave preacher who would come, who was formerly slave preacher. He would say to the enslaved men and women, "Say you are somebody, so you are important to God. You are beloved by God." So religion has always played in in a, a major role in in liberation in this country. And and when you look at the history of this country, and I'm fascinated by this, almost up until modern days, up until modern days. Every protest movement has had men and women of faith involved. The abolitionist movement, the church was just actively involved. Churches were a part of the Underground Railroad, black and white churches, especially almost every black church. The Quakers, as a denomination, were conductors in the Underground Railroad. I mean, they just they rejected slavery as a whole. And then you see the civil rights movement. Has there ever been a more church-led movement in the history of the world? And, yeah. uh, I mean, all of the clergy and everyone was preaching. So... Um, I do think that religion has played a major role in the quest for liberation. Yeah. Jimmy, thank you so much for this time. I, we could go on for another half hour, another hour, but um, we have some restrictions. Uh, Broken and Unbowed is the name of the book by the Reverend Jimmy Hawkins, uh, a History of Black Protest in America. Jimmy is the director of the Office of Public Witness of the Presbyterian Church USA with an office in Washington and also uh, working with the United Nations Office of uh, our denomination. So, Jimmy, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And I appreciate our audience being with us, and thanks to WBNG-TV for uh, putting us all together on the Encounter program each week, sponsored by the Broome County Council of Churches. I'm Jeff Kellum, hoping that in the coming week you'll be gentle with people and, of course, with yourself.